Welcome to the heart of the KSAT 12 newsroom for the first of our three mayoral forums in partnership with Bear Facts and the San Antonio Report. Good evening, I'm Steve Spreester, and we are having three consecutive nights of mayoral forums, and we're going to start with the man who currently owns, currently holds the position, Mayor Ron Nurnberg, and I'm pleased to be joined by the editor of the San Antonio Report, Robert Rivard, who will join me in questioning. And if you're wondering, okay, why are these guys standing so close? We are both vaccinated. I just want to, I just want to say that off the top. We are healthy and vaccinated and hope everyone out there today is vaccinated or soon will be. Maybe that's our first question for the mayor. We should ask him if he's vaccinated. Mayor, are you vaccinated? I uh, got my appointment. I'm scheduled to go get my first shot on Saturday. I can't wait. Well, good for you. All right, I'm gonna let, I'm gonna let Bob ask you the first question here, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, sure. thanks for joining us on the forum this evening. And um, let me start out by talking about something on city council agenda this week that I think is pretty important. And that is a renegotiated lease with the general land office, the state of Texas for redevelopment of the Alamo and Alamo Plaza. And I wanna specifically ask you about the fact that here in the six, seven year process we've been engaged in, there's been countless public hearings and lots of transparency early on. We have just now in the media gotten the documentation for the renegotiated lease. The public's had no opportunity to either uh, uh, review it independently or through us. And yet the council is voting on it this Thursday. What's the rush uh, to vote on such an important matter? There really isn't any rush, uh, I would say, Bob, but the, the renegotiated lease is coming on uh, the heels of uh, several months of discussion about the Alamo plan itself and the, the changes that needed would need to be made uh, with regard to um, the design elements that were impacted by the cenotaph not moving. Uh, as you know, the Texas Historical Commission denied the permit to move the cenotaph. So uh, as a result of that, it allowed us some opportunities to relook at things that the public found uh, you know, objectionable in the first round. Chiefly, uh, public access to the plaza, which now uh, it will remain open without barriers 24-7. Uh, also uh, access and, and closure of the streets. Um, and as we know now, the parades and, and fiesta traditions that we've enjoyed there for decades will be able to continue. Uh, also uh, it had to do with um, the actual lowering of the plaza, which no longer is necessary uh, given uh, the, the elements that um, were, were part of the architectural design. Uh, the final element of this, and I think uh, something that we've been talking a lot about, is the preservation um, and repurposing of the Crockett and Woolworth. All of these elements of the plan that are ultimately part of the amended lease have been discussed, rediscussed uh, for years, and, and now just need to be effectuated in uh, the amended lease. Let me just follow up real quickly, and I think we all agree the, the, the new plan, as we understand it, is a vast improvement in the minds of many. However, I'll give you one detail that I just came across myself. In the original uh, 2018 agreement with the General Land Office, the city taxpayers were on the hook for $50 million if the city withdrew from the 100-year lease with the GLO. That was because the state was going to be making all of the significant investments in plaza redevelopment. Under the new lease deal, the city's investing $38 billion, million, excuse me, in in bond money to do that redevelopment. The state is not making any investment right now in the plaza, but we're still on the hook in the new contract for the $50 million penalty fee. And there is no penalty on the part of the state if they withdraw. So there was always a penalty in the lease document for early withdrawal without cause. And so that's the element that remains in place. Uh, as Lori Houston, who has been involved in this project uh, from the start, uh, at least this current six year iteration of it has explained the amount being spent by San Antonio, uh, the city of San Antonio on this project has not changed. What we have done now is put ourselves in position to uh, essentially man the redesign of the plaza, which is our civic center. Uh, so with regard to the moving pieces and the financial uh, commitments to this project on behalf of the city of San Antonio, that has not changed. Steve, I want to move on and I want to talk about Prop B. Um, and first off, I want to talk about what Prop B is. I believe we have a graphic that kind of explains what Prop B is because there's been a lot of questions uh, about what happens if passed. Prop B would strip police of collective bargaining rights. Proponents argue it will give the city more power to hold problematic police officers accountable. The police union argues 
that without collective bargaining rights, recruitment and retainment of quality police officers will suffer. In our Bear Facts KSAT San Antonio report poll, dozens and dozens of viewers uh, asked us questions on this. But in that poll, 39% of voters in our Bear Facts poll said that they were against Prop B, 34% for it, 28% still undecided. Uh, former Mayor Julian Castro came out yesterday in support of Prop B. Are you in support of Proposition B, yes or no? Again, I've made uh, my thoughts very clear. I'm not taking a position on Proposition B uh, because it's my job as mayor to make sure that there's good faith negotiations happening for the next collective bargaining agreement, of which we are now engaged. I've made my thoughts very clear on what the objectives of our negotiation are uh, with regard to chief uh, executive discipline authority, as well as transparency within the co contract, uh, within the disciplinary process in the contract. Um, these are items that have been discussed for years, uh, really since the last uh, negotiation. They were discussed uh, at length this summer, uh, and ultimately they've been um, effectuated now in the priorities of the collective bargaining negotiation. So my job is to make sure that those negotiations are, are being conducted in good faith. If the voters change the rules uh, by which we can establish um, our, our officer disciplinary process, then we'll go with that. But right now we are going with the rules that are established and that is collective bargaining uh, between the city of San Antonio and the San Antonio Police Officers Association. But you're not actually part of the negotiations. I mean, you're not sitting at the table negotiating exactly what happens. I mean, it's through uh, people with the city attorney's office, correct? That's right. Uh, so I, however, I guess I, I'm just, that's why I was yeah. trying to get to the next point of why not take a, why not take a position on this? Because Steve, the, the city council is the one that directs the negotiating team on the priorities that are articulated by the public. The city council will ultimately have to vote for or against this contract. So if we're gonna engage the, the negotiating table in good faith, we have to make sure that we are doing that uh, without also undercutting the ability for that process to unfold fairly. Mayor, last summer you used some pretty colorful language in support of the Black Lives Matters protesters. Mm -hmm. You said the buck stops here uh, with you at your office and that you expect people to hold you accountable. In the event that Proposition B does not pass and the, and, and the uh, fix SAPD do not succeed winning at the ballot box, will, uh, will city negotiators hold, stand, uh, will they hold firm with the police union and not give them a new contract until they have backed down on the uh, arbitration for police discipline? Yes, I believe uh, we will and we should. Um, and, and again, the priorities of the negotiation from the city side are the priorities articulated by the city council. And so every member of the city council will be held accountable to maintaining that position. I'm the, uh, the presiding officer as mayor, uh, and I've made my thoughts very clear. We have clear objectives for negotiation, and anything that falls short, we won't support. You don't feel... You, you feel like you're living up to that pledge that you made uh, outside, I believe it was of uh, the old county courthouse, that d to hold you accountable. You, don't you, you think you're still being true to those words when you told people you would be for accountability and transparency? Yes, and, and when we talked about that, accountability is a process and it doesn't always happen quickly. And, and I said that in particular because I know the process to achieve disciplinary reforms, which have been fought for for years and transparency is a long time coming. And it would sometimes be frustrating, especially when we're bargaining these things at the table. I knew there would be frustrations and I wanted to make sure that people knew I understood that and I wanna be held accountable for the outcomes uh, of what we're trying to achieve in terms of the negotiation. That's what that was all about. Uh, we can get this done. We've got to get it done at the table, at least under the current rules. Um, and, and it may not be easy, it may not be quick, uh, but I want to be held accountable to it. Mayor, um, we're not seeing Black Lives Matters protests in the streets now, but we're all watching a trial in Minneapolis uh, in the George Floyd case. We saw an accidental fatal shooting by a police officer of a, another person of color uh, two nights ago. Uh, we've seen what happened in Herndon, Virginia to a black man who was in a U.S. military uniform uh, that was treated highly inappropriately. Is it still front of mind for you? Um, do you remain highly empathetic to how, um, how fearful people of color, particularly black people, are of police, including police in San Antonio, and how important a, a fundamental change in culture is 
of how officers on the street regard minorities? Uh, I absolutely am, Bob. And, and to deny that there is not the presence of systemic racial injustice in any city in America is to uh, avert the truth. And that's what we have to solve. And that's what we are embarked on together to solve in a, a number of different avenues. And it's not just policing, but let's focus on uh, policing. Uh, that's why in the, in the heat of what was occurring in the summer, I called for use of force policy reviews and reforms. We got a number of those things done that, that were administrative in nature. We also instituted a body cam policy, which previous to uh, the summer did not exist. We're engaged in now the process of, of bringing disciplinary reform and transparency to the police contract, which again has been a long time coming. All these things are processed in the police department and uh, they need to get done. And, and, and there is no loss in sense of priority from my office uh, and, and I believe in my colleagues as well. It, it takes time uh, and, and it takes effort and, and we are going to get that done. We, we reached out to the uh, editor of the San Antonio Observer to ask him if he could ask the mayoral candidates a question, what would he ask? So I wanna play that tape for you right now. I think this whole uh, pandemic thing has, had a, has opened a lot of eyes and it's revealed a lot of things as far as the desperate treatment of some communities in our city. And so when you look at the effects of environmental racism, and when I see environmental racism, is all of these preconditions that people have that the pandemic had attacked, that COVID attacks, most of those things occur because of the communities we live in, because of the quality of air, because of the, the, the chemical so-called plants that are there and the forever drugs that they leave in our water and our ground lack of, and lack of health care is part two of that. You know, so as mayor, I want to know what would this candidate who wants to be mayor, what are they going to do differently now that we know all of this stuff? You know, we, before it was just conjecture. So now this stuff has had a devastating attack. You look at um, somewhere in the area of 56,000 African Americans died as because of the pandemic. That is an unbelievable number when you look at the percentage of the population that we make up and you compare it to others. And so what are you going to do differently? How are, how, how are African Americans in San Antonio going to finally become part of the community where our well-being is considered as well as everyone else's? That's Douglas Heath, the editor from the San Antonio Observer. I'll let you answer his question, Mr. Mayor. Well, I, I think that his question, and I've talked with Doug uh, several times, uh, Doug's question illustrates why this issue of racial and socioeconomic injustice is not just simply relegated to policing. Uh, what we have been doing here in the city of San Antonio since I've been mayor is focusing how we can restore equity in all parts of our community. And I have to tip my hat to my colleagues over the last four years who have maintained that focus on equity. That's inclu that includes how we deliver essential services, how we invest in neighborhoods and infrastructure. That includes how we provide for economic opportunity and access to education. And I'm very proud of the efforts like Alamo Promise and the workforce uh, readiness program that we have currently going on that is delivering those opportunities directly to communities. It also includes housing, uh, housing stability in all parts of our community, uh, housing affordability. So we have been maintaining a focus on equity. And I, and I do have to say, this is another reason why I say hold us accountable, hold me accountable. We know that the process of restoring equity in our communities, racial, social, economic, et cetera, equity in our communities um, takes time and it will take generational change. Uh, but we have to continue to push forward every single day with every policy that we create, every initiative that we undertake. Equity has to be, be a focus for us to turn the tide on what has been generations in the making to create this inequity in our communities. And this is not just a San Antonio issue. I have conversations with my peers around the country on this topic in particular. Mayor, the uh, registered voters in the Bear Facts poll give you very high grades for the leadership you've demonstrated during the pandemic. You and Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf, I think they respect the way the two of you have stood up to state officials on disagreements over public health and safety protocols. On the other hand, I think it's laid bare the pandemic that our Metro Health Department is woefully underfunded, was not prepared for a pandemic, had a leadership crisis amid the pandemic. Uh, we still don't have a permanent leader of Metro Health. You have a fiscal budget planning coming up here this summer. I, I wonder whether or not as mayor, you're seeing a need to invest much more deeply in public health in San Antonio and, 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 and address some of the issues that our colleague at the San Antonio Observer just uh, uh, listed. Uh 
Bob, I can tell you uh, with 100% clarity, without a doubt. Uh, and I think that's one of the takeaways, the learning of our entire country coming out of this pandemic is that this country, and, and including that cities like San Antonio, were not prepared and, not, and did not fully resource public health infrastructure. And, and I believe, especially on the topic of equity, that it's health outcomes that we can best see whether or not we're achieving uh, the mark, that we're, we're, we're having success with the policies that we're uh, undertaking. So I do believe that Metro Health needs to continue to be a, or needs to be a bigger priority um, and, and also a bigger priority within the general fund. So those dollars aren't ebbing and flowing based on federal and state grants. Uh, during this pandemic, I will, I, I will say this, um, the Metro Health team and the healthcare professionals in our community, w without exception, uh, performed incredibly well under the worst circumstances. And, and I wanna thank every single nurse, doctor, uh, healthcare provider um, that was out there on the front lines that continues to be out there on the front lines working very hard. This was all teamwork, but absolutely we need to keep, we need to make sure that they're better prepared uh, in the future. Uh, we did allocate roughly $75 million of our CARES Act uh, Recovering Resiliency Program to uh, the health side of this pandemic. Um, and, and we're gonna continue to make it a priority going forward in terms of the bottom line of what we're trying to achieve here in the city of San Antonio. I wanna move on now to the uh, winter storm and the outages that we saw. And when we look at the Barifax KSAT San Antonio report poll, the disapproval rate for CPS Energy went from 22% when we first started Barifax in February of 2020 to 49% last month. More voters in our poll say they are concerned about rate increases on utility bills. And we actually had a viewer question uh, on KSAT.com. The viewer question from Robert is, do you feel that CPS's communication to the public was acceptable in February? If not, do you feel there should be a shakeup of leadership? So first, uh, let me state unequivocally that we have to examine every part of the local and state response to this crisis, and we need to make changes where they're due. And, and one of those areas that needs to be improved is communication. And that's not just communication from the state to the locals, but to the locals to the communities. Uh, and as you know, I appointed a committee to do an independent review of this entire uh, crisis event, the, the preparation, uh, the communication and the response. Uh, they're undergoing that right now, and they're also fielding questions from the community to make sure that they cover all the bases. But, and we're gonna own the things that we need to improve. Uh, so yes, I think uh, communication is one of those areas. We also need to, to look at uh, reform of our state grid. I've been in communication with our legislators, and I wanna say thank you to the Bear County delegation in particular, including uh, Senator Jose Menendez. We are calling for ERCOT. Uh, to uh, stabilize the energy grid and do the things that were promised back 10 years ago that would have been in a, put us in a better position to manage through a crisis event like this. Uh, but we are going to examine every aspect of this and make the improvements necessary, including uh, communication and coordination of communication among all parties. Do you have an opinion tonight on whether Paula Gold Williams should stay as the leader of CPS Energy? I think those kinds of things are premature until we have a complete investigation in terms of what happened and how we can make sure it doesn't happen again. But believe me, uh, every question will be answered and we'll make sure that everything is being held accountable and that we make the improvements that are necessary to ensure that San Antonio is not in this position again. Mayor, uh, former city councilman Reed Williams, who's pretty highly regarded in the community, is leading that effort on your behalf. Has he briefed you unofficially on his findings? Um, do you have a firm timeline on when those findings will be complete and when we and the public will, will have an opportunity to review them? Um, we don't have, uh, so I talked to Reed uh, probably a week or so ago, and what they have done so far is they have separated the, the categories uh, of response from our overall emergency operations at the local level to CPS Energy to SAWS. Uh, and they have begun now to field all of the questions and begun to send those questions and, and request those uh, data points from the different parties that, that are in charge of them. Uh, I would expect that over the next few weeks, uh, they're gonna compile that data. They've been having public meetings that are live streamed on the San Antonio website. And uh, I would imagine that within the next uh, few weeks to a month or so, that they're gonna have a report back that we'll be able to examine. 
I want to move on now to uh, kind of what's happened. You, you, you've been very clear about the fact that uh, COVID and this pandemic didn't create these fault lines. They just exacerbated some of these fault lines that we're seeing in our community. Lisa, Jackson's is, Lisa Jackson is a public relations person in San Antonio, and she asked a question specifically about some of those fault lines and about what happens. Let's listen into her question. Do we have that, Patrick? This TV stuff is difficult, man. <laughs> well, let, before we get to that, great. before we get to that, Deborah has a question. What proactive plan do you have to prevent San Antonio areas from becoming tent cities? Homelessness is always ranked one or two in our Bearfax uh, case at San Antonio report polls of concerns of the community. I mean, what proactive plan do you have to prevent San Antonio cities from becoming tent San Antonio areas from becoming tent cities? Yeah, first, I think we have to recognize that that homelessness is not just uh, not having a house. It is oftentimes and most oftentimes a symptom of a number, uh, an array of social uh, challenges. Uh, anything from domestic violence to substance abuse to mental illness uh, to um, loss of employment and other issues. So in order for us to address this comprehensively and, and make sure that we don't lose the battle as we've seen other cities, even in Texas, um, we have to address those issues comprehensively and go in and, and, and meet folks where they are uh, to understand what challenges they're experiencing. Um, we have to resource all the different organizations that are, are conducting restitution and dealing with those challenges to help connect people to those resources. The challenge that we're re really experiencing in the homelessness service pipeline is establishing trust. Every single person has a story. Every single person has unique challenges. And you have to develop a level of trust with folks that are experiencing homelessness in order to connect them with the services needed to prevent it. Um, so that's what we're going through right now. We're at the beginning of a homelessness strategic plan implementation. Uh, I'm very confident uh, based on the great work that our homeless providers are doing right now um, and, and the parties that we have had working on this issue uh, that we'll begin to turn the tide. It has been exacerbated, there's no doubt, by the pandemic, but we need to focus on making sure the homelessness is not treated as the problem in and of itself but it's a series of social challenges that are experienced by individuals in our community that we need to connect uh, to services. Well, one of the things that they're debating right now in Austin is banning camping in public areas, which is basically be banning some of these tent cities. Do you think that's an answer? So first of all, San Antonio doesn't permit camping in public places. Um, I need to make sure that people know that. What you're seeing with the encampments is that we also realize that we simply can't scoot the problem away. Uh, we have to, in order for us to deal with the challenge of encampments is we have to get folks connected to services. Otherwise the encampments will continue to come back as we've seen. So um, we do not permit um, public camping, but we're also trying to deal with this in a compassionate manner that connects people to services. So we don't just move the problem from one part of town to another. Mayor, there's a lot riding for everyone, you as the mayor, but all of us on the $150 million plus initiative to, uh, that voters approved in the last election to fund workforce development, which has become acutely that much more important in the pandemic when we've seen so many people not only go jobless, uh, lose their, their employment, but we've seen the actual jobs go away, particularly in service industries. And I'm, there's, there's, what do you tell people that are skeptical about public workforce development initiatives in general and whether or not you can train somebody who to begin with does not have the kind of education and, and background and tools that make them a, uh, a, a candidate for a, you know, a, a highly trained job? Well, first, I would like to thank uh, the voters of San Antonio for having faith in this initiative. As you know, I think it was about 77 percent of San Antonio voters in November approved this program, which is coming on the first phase, which is part of our recovery and resiliency effort. So there is faith that we need to do something uh, to provide access to economic mobility in our city, and voters have supported that. Uh, but I think the skepticism is justified, and we can use that to sharpen our approach. Uh, we have to make sure that we are um, targeting folks um, and, and not just creating a new benefit. So we know that in San Antonio, one of our great challenges over the last several decades has been generational poverty. 
the lack of economic mobility that, that goes handed down from one generation to the next that has created in San Antonio over the last 10 years the highest poverty rate among major metros in, this, in, in, in the country. So we're focusing on that to create access to education and training so that San Antonians can have the skills to take jobs that are sitting open and vacant in our community. Believe it or not, based on the jobs report from the EDF, in San Antonio, there are 10,000 jobs in healthcare, 7,000 jobs in technology, 6,000 jobs in construction. The list goes on in terms of high wage, high demand careers that are being unfilled because there is simply a lack of available skilled workers. So we're bridging that gap. And in the process, we're gonna change the economic trajectory of thousands of families in our city. Um, and I think that that is an opportunity that San Antonio voters, San Antonio public realizes is the way to uh, change the trajectory of what has been a low wage city here in San Antonio. So I'm grateful for the effort. It's already bearing fruit. Uh, we know through the Train for Jobs program, 64% of participants are living in poverty. So we're creating economic mobility for thousands of San Antonio families. Um, and we know that in, in this pandemic, um, the, the, mo the hardest hit are, are women. And 72% of our participants in the Train for Jobs program are women. We're reaching into communities of color who have had fewer opportunities to, to access high uh, in-demand careers. So it's bearing fruit. It's obviously done at scale um, and, and, and is, is an ambitious program, which is going to turn out to be one of the keys to us unlocking cycles of generational poverty here in San Antonio. Mr. Mayor, when we talk about the workforce development program and, and what will happen, you know, I, I on occasion get out on a bike and ride, you know, some of the trails around. It may not look like it, but I do on occasion. Uh, and some, of the, you, some of the criticism that I've heard whether rightly or wrongly, I want to say that I just want to give you a chance to address this, is that sure. that a greenways, trails, and the aquifer were abandoned for VIA and workforce development. How do you answer the people that say that? I would say that couldn't be further from the truth. And, and I want to thank um, my colleagues on the city council and our counterparts over the commissioner's court for having the foresight to deal with what has been a significant generational challenge and also pave a path to the future for both the Creekway Trails and for the Aqua Protection Program. As you know, San Antonio, uh, the city council uh, uh, initiated the longest commitment to the Edwards Aqua Protection Program in its history, a decade long commitment now uh, that we are committed to, to ensure the Edwards Aqua Protection Program, the conservation easement program continues unabated. It's going to continue. And it actually is still funded with the sales tax until that program uh, runs out. In addition, VIA uh, has been funded now with the sales tax revenue starting in 2026 to go to the one eight cent and finally bring uh, that piece of the revenue that was originally created for transit to um, our, our community's public transportation system. That uh, revenue stream that's been guaranteed by voters now automatically right now today allows us to go to the federal government and start bringing back some of the grants and infrastructure dollars that we've been missing out for, for generations. So we can begin our transit future today because of the vote that the, that the citizens of San Antonio made. Now with, the, with regard to the Creekway Trail system, this is uh, the part that I think is going to be very exciting for us. Number one, uh, we know that the county made commitment to take on the next round of capital construction. They're taking that up, uh, I think in June uh, to effectuate that. We also know, and in my view, that the Creekway Trails program is one of the most popular programs that this city has ever undertaken. And it is my goal uh, into going into the 2022 bond program, along with the infrastructure dollars that we expect from the federal government, that we make the Greenway Trail system not just complete, but enhance it, make it bigger, make it a mobility option for people in our community, enhance the trails to connect them to more neighborhood centers, to retail centers, so that people around the city can access the Greenway Trail system, not just for recreation, but for transportation as well. We have the opportunity with the infrastructure priorities made clear by the federal government and our 2022 bond to couple with the with the county and make this linear creekway system a reason why people want to live here, invest here, and raise their children here. Mayor, I wasn't going to bring up bicycles tonight, but Steve did. So I want to talk <laughs> about cycling on the streets in yes. the space of five Please. days now. We've lost two cyclists, one Beatrice Gonzalez. 
in a group ride, which is perceived widely in the cycling community as the safest way to ride on the streets. She was struck and killed by a drunk driver. Even as in San Antonio and Bear County, we're about to see another trial start for a surgeon who was fatally struck by a drunk driver uh, several years ago. Uh, meanwhile, yet another cyclist uh, two nights ago was shot and killed uh, right in Tobin Hill near downtown. Um, people do not feel like San Antonio is becoming a safer city to cycle in. We're about to start planning another five-year bond cycle, which is how the city invests hundreds of millions of dollars in infrastructure, streets, sidewalks, etc. cetera. Um, are you more committed than uh, the council has been in the past to actually seeing San Antonio become safer for pedestrians and cyclists? There's been a lot of rhetorical pledges, but there, there hasn't been a lot of investment that really is reflected in the streetscape. I, I think there, there is no question uh, what you're saying, Bob, is true. Uh, and, and let me um, just say thank you to my colleague, um, my outgoing colleague, Council Member Shirley Gonzalez, for staying true to this cause, even when she was the only one on council talking about it. But I think um, the time has long passed for us to ensure that bicyclists don't get killed on our roadways. Uh, and we have to actually build a safe bicycle plan here in San Antonio, one that's not just uh, uh, supposedly complete by painting a stripe down the side of a roadway. Uh, we have had um, ambition to have a bicycle master plan or to have a bicycle system here in San Antonio, but we have not had uh, the ability uh, and the fortitude to put our money where our mouth is. I hope that that comes to an end this year with our bond program and the infrastructure uh, program that we expect from the federal government. We're already working on uh, the 2022 bond pillars of uh, priorities, strategic outcomes that we're shooting towards. And one thing that I've called for is uh, connectivity, public health, and resiliency. Those all come together in active transportation. So I'm hoping to make the bicycle master plan effectuated by the 2022 bond uh, and, and that we actually get uh, the, the plan begun in construction. Uh, we know we've had some fights. We don't have to go back into them about particular roadways, but we simply cannot continue to build the city the way we have for the last generation, which is just for cars. Uh, I've called for that. I, I plan to make that real uh, as we go into the next 2022 bond. Um, and I hope that the public and the council will join us alongside. I, I am very uh, happy to, to um, mention that I've had conversations with Tamika Monteville, who is our new transportation director about this. Uh, she is also excited about the opportunity to transform San Antonio's transportation system into a bona fide multimodal system uh, where people can travel safely. Um, and uh, we look forward to great change coming uh, over the next couple of years, starting, uh, starting now with the bond plan. Steve, I wasn't going to bring up Broadway either, but the mayor did indirectly. But I do want to say in, <laughs> in 2011, Mayor, the council passed the bicycle master plan. That's 10 years ago now. It was never implemented. Yes, uh, and, and same thing with zoning, Bob, as you know, uh, great intentions are unwound by the individual decisions on particular projects and, and pieces of property. And we saw that happen. Again, we don't need to relive the past, but we see that project after project, the corner is cut, uh, a, a discount is made, and the project becomes, uh, or the project itself falls short of our ambition to transform our transportation system. That's what needs to stop. Um, and I, I am hopeful now with a, a transportation planner with her eyes on this issue uh, will keep us true to that cause. I'm hoping that uh, there will be much more bicycle advocacy uh, among the city council as we get towards our infrastructure planning. And, you know, frankly, uh, you know, even my north side colleagues uh, ride bicycles and know that uh, a multimodal system with, that is a, a transportation infrastructure that's more than just cars is important for the city, regardless of whether or not you ride a bike. It's important economically. It's important for safety. Promises put into practice. And I, th I think we promised you that this would be 30 minutes and we're way over that at this point. Promised our viewers as well. So I want to thank you for staying with us and answering some questions. I don't want to go, though, without giving you a chance to, to give a message directly to people who are watching at home, people who maybe haven't decided who they're going to vote for yet. Uh, and, you know, I I'll give you a minute for lack of a better word for a closing statement here uh, to the people that are watching this. 
Sure. Well, it's it's uh, it's been great to join you. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Bob and Steve. Um, I want to just say thank you to the entire San Antonio community. Um, we have seen an extraordinarily challenging time all across this country, but the way San Antonio has responded, rallied together, uh, neighbor helping neighbor, uh, is truly the best of San Antonio. And that is why we are on the cusp of finally putting this pandemic behind us. We've worked together quintessentially of San Antonio through teamwork. Uh, and that is why when I talk to my peers around the country, they view San Antonio on as strong a foundation as any city in the country to come back stronger, more resilient, and more equitable. So my message is thank you. It has been the honor of a lifetime to serve you as mayor. I look forward to earning your support again to continue. Uh, and I wanna say thank you um, for uh, making me a better leader for this city. Uh, God bless you all and have a great night. Mayor Ron Nuremberg. Thank you for your time. This was the first in our series of mayoral candidate forums this week. Tomorrow we will be joined by Greg Brockhouse. In the 2019 runoff election, he fell short of a win. The latest Verifax and San Antonio report poll uh, show him favored by local Republicans, but not favored overall. How does he view our latest Verifax KSAT San Antonio report poll, along with many of the topics we talked about tonight, will be discussed tomorrow. It begins at 6.30, our live stream at 7 o'clock. Uh, a lot of these big ticket issues we will also discuss with Denise Gutierrez Homer on Thursday. There are 11 other mayoral candidates on the ballot, but these three have previous experience as candidates and have attracted significant voter support, which is why they are part of this forum. A reminder and perhaps the most important reminder of the night, early voting in the May 1st election begins next week, next Monday, starting April 19th, runs through Tuesday, April 27th. You can find information on what's on the ballot and how to vote right now on our website, ksat.com. Just click Vote 2021 in the News tab. For all of us at KSAT 12, I want to thank Bear Facts and the San Antonio Report, Bob Rivard, thank for you, being Steve. part of this discussion tonight and for letting us drag you down here for two more nights. Look forward to being here again tomorrow night. Yeah, thanks, Bob. Mr. Mayor, thank you. Night, y'all. Good night from KSAT.